So let's start with a question on elbow arthritis and arthroplasty. All of the following are characteristics of synovium affected by rheumatoid arthritis except uh, the answer being disruption of the basement membrane. So we know that the basement membrane is not disrupted in rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, affected synovial tissue uh, as the synovium lacks a basement membrane. Uh, there are two layers in the synovium, intimal and uh, sublining, uh, and two, tells, two cell types. Uh, and rheumatoid arthritis, the synovial changes are hyperplasia uh, with increasing from the cell layers, uh, uh, decreased apoptosis, uh, increased angiogenesis, and abundant lymphocytes. Um, so, talking a little bit about rheumatoid arthritis, it's a chronic autoimmune disease, uh, affects women more often than men. Uh, one of the great achievements in medicine have been the advances in pharmacologic management, for, but for elbow surgeons like Buddy and me, uh, it's really diminished the work we do, and, and I guess in the long run, that's a very good thing. So, patients are not being as damaged by rheumatoid disease as they had previously been. Uh, without these medicines. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, the immunology of it is it's a cell-mediated immune response uh, initiated at the soft tissue level, so the synovial lining. Uh, as the process progresses, it involves cartilage and later bone. Uh, many of these patients present with positive rheumatoid factor, uh, which can deposit in other tissues. So important to remember that rheumatoid arthritis is not really just an orthopedic problem, but a systemic problem, <clears throat> excuse me, affecting multiple tissues. Um, some of the cell damage or the tissue damage is mediated by uh, interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha and many of the medicines uh, that are, uh, the newer medicines uh, are directed or target these two pathways. Uh, there is some belief that this may be an infectious etiology uh, as well. Uh, the pathoanatomy, the cascade of events, uh, is that there are antigen antibody and antibody antibody reactions. There's pro proliferation uh, at the microvascular level. There's intimal hyperplasia, which leads to the synovial response, uh, subluxation of the joint, cell chondrocyte death, so the cartilage destruction, and then secondary bony changes. Uh, there are specific genetic, genetic loci, uh, HLA-DR4 and HLA-DW4 uh, are prominent in these patients and important to recognize some of the uh, associated medical conditions. Uh, and you'll see uh, these on the test uh, fairly consistent. You'll, you'll see the OITE has tested this 19 times and this self-assessment 16 times. Uh, also, Sjogren's disease, Sjogren's syndrome is also associated with rheumatoid disease. So our first question on rheumatoid arthritis, uh, rheumatoid uh, immunologic testing of anti-CCP is most commonly used for the diagnosis and prognosis of which immunologic condition. Uh, since we're talking about rheumatoid arthritis, that's a pretty good guess. So uh, anti-CCP CCP are commonly used as markers uh, for rheumatoid arthritis. A rheumatoid uh, factor, so it has historically been used as a primary marker, but uh, recent uh, advances have shown that anti-CCP antibodies uh, to be very sensitive and specific, so more sensitive and specific uh, than rheumatoid factor, uh, and high levels of anti-CCP have been shown to be indicative of more erosive uh, disease process, so the more mutilans form of rheumatoid arthritis. So looking here, this is kind of highlighting what we just talked about. Labs, the anti-CCP uh, is the most sensitive and specific test. Again, this is a highly tested fact. Many of these folks have positive rheumatoid titers as well. Uh, and the serum and joint fluid analysis, what you can expect, are listed here. There are diagnostic criteria for rheumatoid arthritis. These have been well established for quite some time. Uh, morning stiffness is a hallmark of rheumatoid arthritis, and this is a commonly um, included vignette in folks with rheumatoid disease and positive rheumatoid factor, among uh, many others. 
Non-operative treatment, uh, pharmacologic treatment, is the mainstay of treatment in patients with rheumatoid disease. There are certain first-line drugs, some of which are commonly used today. Others have more historic relevance in rheumatoid disease, but anti-inflammatories, anti-malarials, and, and remitting uh, agents, uh, so gold and sulfasalazine, those are more historic, but still are used. Methotrexate is a very commonly used uh, drug in rheumatoid disease as a first-line treatment. Uh, and then steroids are still used in patients uh, both as a maintenance drug and as a uh, drug against flares. Uh, there have been, there's been a tremendous development in uh, the medical management of rheumatoid disease. These are the first and second line treatments that we've talked about and, and more recently, probably over the last few decades, some of the biologic agents, the TNF antagonists. Uh, these you need to know, uh, particularly the Enbrel and the Remicades in here, some of the other ones, Humira and Simsia as well, all target uh, the TNF-alpha receptor, and then uh, uh, Kineret, which is an IL-1 antagonist, is another biologic agent, but uh, against the IL-1 um, um, uh, pathway. So another question in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, TNF-alpha is blocked by which of the following agents? And this is uh, 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 number three, this is uh, Embril. Uh, so this is a biologically uh, designed uh, tumor necrosis factor receptive uh, immunoglobulin G fusion protein. It's a mouthful. Um, uh, methotrexate is a chemotherapeutic agent uh, uh, used uh, to inhibit lymphocytes. Gold inhibits monocytes, while sulfasalazine is an anti-inflammatory, uh, which decreases some of the uh, prostaglandins and leukotrienes, which are destructive to the joint. Uh, you can read the rest of that. So next question, uh, regarding bone erosion and rheumatoid arthritis, which of the following statements are true? So TNF, uh, TNF and IL-6 blockade uh, leads to slowing of bone erosion. And we know that bony erosion is an end stage of rheumatoid disease after uh, the synovial and cartilaginous uh, destruction occurs. And this is mediated in the TNF and the uh, interleukin pathways. And so blockade of these through TNF alpha antagonists and IL antagonists will slow the erosion. So the perioperative use of which medication has been shown to increase the post-op infection following orthopedic procedures in rheumatoid patients. And so we know that um, the uh, uh, TNF-alpha antagonists are powerful immune suppressants. Uh, these, these have fairly long half-lives uh, and need to be stopped, and we'll talk about in a second here. Um, when they should be discontinued relative to surgery preoperatively uh, to minimize the risk of infection. And all of these medicines should be started within 10 to 14 days or not within 10 to 14 days postoperatively. So any of these TNF-alpha antagonists uh, can lead to increased risk of infection. Uh, infliximid uh, is a medication associated with opportunistic infections uh, in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. What is the mechanism of action? And we know that this is a TNF-alpha inhibitor, so that one of the antagonists uh, for TNF-alpha. And again, this is one of the newer generations of biologic agents. Next question on rheumatoid, which of the following drugs is an IL-1 antagonist, typically used as a second-line agent in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis? And this uh, is anakinra. And again, this is a naturally occurring molecule that blocks the effects of pro-inflammatory cytokine IL-1. So uh, again, this is just knowing that there is an IL-1 antagonist. Um, so back to our, our, our kind of follow-up information here to, to kind of support the topics we talked about. Uh, operative treatment uh, is dictated by the specific condition in rheumatoid arthritis. And we know that uh, pharmacologic management has really reduced the need for surgical management in this patient population. So if you can catch uh, their disease early and avoid uh, the cartilage and bony uh, it, uh, destruction in this, we can intervene and prevent uh, the need for surgery. 
this talks a little bit about when to start uh, stop uh, medications preoperatively, and this has to do with the half-lives of the medications, so anti-inflammatories, uh, aspirin 7 to 10 days, anti-inflammatories 5 days, methotrexate, actually this is a newer recommendation to continue methotrexate through the operative period, and then you can see for, for the the TNF uh, alpha antagonists and the IL-1 antagonists. These are these. Oops, sorry about that. These are dependent a bit on uh, the medication uh, that's being used, but these are stopped at least a week, sometimes up to two weeks uh, ahead. And so you want to plan the dosing interval. You want to plan your surgery based on the patient's normal dosing interval, so that you can, if they have a monthly infusion, then you can stop it at their last infusion, do their surgery, and then start up and maintain their infusion schedule. It changes a little bit if they're infused more commonly. So next question, this is on rheumatoid arthritis. So a 67-year-old woman with rheumatoid arthritis has a three-year history of gradually progressive right elbow pain and limited function despite intraarticular injections uh, and medical management. She previously went, underwent a rheumatoid hand, dis, a hand reconstruction, has no pain or dis dysfunction of the ipsilateral shoulder. Radiographs are shown in 93 A and B. What is the most appropriate treatment? Uh, we're not showing the other image, but the, the, the first image on the left, there was an AP and lateral, uh, but this is somebody with advanced rheumatoid disease, so you can see the cupping of, of the medial side of the joint. Uh, you can see a, uh, let me get your my little pointer here, uh, you can see a bone cyst up here uh, in the supracondyl or column laterally and some cystic changes in the ulna behind the distal humerus. So this is a 67-year-old with advanced rheumatoid disease. Uh, most appropriate treatment for this patient is total elbow arthroplasty. So this is the treatment of choice for end-stage rheumatoid patients. Uh, given the advanced nature of her disease with bony erosion, synovectomy, interposition are unlikely to provide lasting benefit, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, interposition, uh, both with the rheumatoid patients and the arthritis patients uh, a little later. Arthrodesis and resection arthroplasty are salvage operations. They are certainly arthrodesis is a definitive operation, but uh, it's it's a tough sell in, in, in our patient population who want function in addition to pain relief. So we'll move on to interposition arthroplasty. This is, we're talking specifically now about the rheumatoid population. So interposition arthroplasty is indicated in young active patients who are not good candidates for elbow arthroplasty. Uh, this is a recontouring of the distal humeral articular surface and you cover the humeral articular surface with some tissue uh, classically described as cutis, which is harvested typically from the groin region, Achilles tendon allo or autograft, excuse me, Achilles tendon allograft, tensor fascia lata, either allo or autograft, and more recently I've moved in this operation to use dermal allografts. They come in larger sizes now and come in thicker grafts, uh, which work fairly nicely. Um, I, distraction, uh, external fixation, I, I'm not so sure you need the distraction, but certainly the external fixation uh, to, for, to allow for soft tissue healing, particularly of the collateral ligaments in this patient population, is a really important uh, feature of this operation. And nowadays we have internal fixators, so uh, implantable internal fixators that stabilize the joint. Uh, they do require another surgery for removal, so you have to go back to the OR. Now, the long and short of interposition is you're buying time, and the results of it are less predictable than total elbow, and it's really a bridge, ultimately, in many of these patients to total elbow replacement. Total elbow arthroplasty, the indication is primarily pain relief in certain patients who have enough destruction of their joint in the rheumatoid population that they develop instability. It's a reasonable uh, option in this. And if you look at Bernie Mori's original series on total elbow arthroplasty for acute fractures, nine of the 14 patients in his series actually developed instability from a pathologic fracture. So that is a a, tip, a, a not unknown end stage of the rheumatoid process. 
Uh, this patient, patient population, semi-constrained elbow replacements, and we'll go through the different kinds of elbow replacements in a bit, tend to have the best results. And this is probably the, well, not probably, it is the most reliable procedure for advanced uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And quite frankly, it's the best indication for elbow arthroplasty with the best survivorship over time. Obviously, there are complications uh, to surgery in the rheumatoid population. Uh, Postoperative wound infection is obviously something that's really uh, important, and, and it is well known in the rheumatoid population that prior uh, a history of a surgery and most specifically surgical site infection does increase the risk of post-op infection. And we certainly talked about the immunosuppressive therapies, the biologic agents are powerful immune suppressants and do increase the risk of infection in these patients. And to the right is a paper uh, that talks about prior surgical site infection uh, uh, um, uh, and, uh, excuse me, surgical site infections and the use uh, of uh, anti-TNF agents. And I can tell you from personal experience that I've had several patients who have had a well-functioning elbow replacement and have had and have been placed on anti-TNF agents or even increased their dose of TNF agents and have gone on to very rapid infection. So it is a real, it is a real issue. Uh, so we talked about these different uh, agents and when they should be discontinued. Uh, it's variable again based on the half-life of these drugs. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.